planning. Today we talk about working with communities, how to incentivize and reward researchers and citizens. This is a quite relevant topic if we focus on citizen science up as the role of stakeholders and their participation in shaping research and innovation actions is quite relevant. We'll, I'll walk you through this topic and show you a, several elements that are quite relevant to be taken into account. So, first of all, let me get the background for this workshop. Well, first of all, citizen participation and stakeholders engagement are at the heart of any activities of the European Union, including research and in, in their research and innovation agenda. Engagement is crucial for tackling societal challenges because they can provide us, citizens and the other stakeholders can provide us with uh, a greater understanding of what their needs are. And that is the base for designing solutions that can create value. So citizen engagement is relevant at all stages of research and innovation actions, uh, from commissioning and identifying the needs, especially to frame what the problems may be, and at the same time to co-design solutions that may be beneficial for different types of stakeholders, and also trying to uh, <clears throat> prototyping and releasing solutions that make sense and that are also organizationally feasible. Now, they're at the heart of work, but it is not easy to get uh, everybody all, uh, engaged in, uh, in Citizen Science Hub for several reasons. Therefore, there are several ways in which we can motivate them. Now, if we look at citizen engagement in, uh, and community engagement in citizen science, this is at the base of all phases of activities. And the, as I said, they can help uh, in, different, uh, uh, in different phases of the work and they can support, uh, you know, by sharing data, they can support by sharing um, details and characterization of the needs they have. They can support by providing effort, their time, their expertise, their activities, and also by providing uh, financial support. Um, there are different ways in, in which we can engage them. But uh, this is about an active engagement of uh, users and co-producers in the world of citizen science. If we look at citizen science per se, one of the key aspects that consists um, of, you know, the characterizing principle is the co-production component. Now, intrinsically speaking, if we talk about services, citizens are co-produced by definition because the service exists only when, you know, some users utilize it. Otherwise, we have factor conditions that can be used or are ready to be used, but there's no service un unless the user utilizes it. In citizen science, as we may also produce services, um, we may not necessarily see this intrinsic component of co-production as embedded in the world of, um, of citizen science actions. But, you know, in general terms, citizens and other stakeholders uh, and community members are considered to be a relevant core element of um, active participation because they can offer effort, knowledge, time, and they can participate at different stages of the production of science. Their work can be contributing with effort, it could be collaboration at different phases of the activities of citizen science, and also co-creation of, of projects. So they really play a role across all the phases of uh, science uh, project component. And there's different ways in which we can understand what motivates people to actively contribute to um, citizen science projects. Um, overall, the motives can be either extrinsic uh, for, you know, personal individual circumstances, uh, intrinsic because of interest, curiosity, enthusiasm, or the willingness to take part in an action to demonstrate that they can do it. Or it could be also a pro-social motivation, doing it for the greater, um, you know, impact 
for the community. But there are also non-emotional drivers that are more explicit and they may have to deal with um, elevating their professional capacity or taking you know, parts in activities that offer uh, some sort of uh, uh, physical incentive, like a certificate, uh, like you know, credits um, for training that may enhance the curricula of certain participants, or you know, other motivating factors. And so in this particular workshop, we're going to address them and see uh, what can facilitate and what can hinder engagement in citizen science projects. There are several barriers that may hinder it. Among that, there's lack of capacity to fully state what the scope of the project is and you know, make the possible uh, participants understand what their role should be and what their contribution will lead, how their contribution will lead to results. Or there's just you know, an attitude that, you know, is favorable of engagement, but at the same time doesn't really lead to that. And there's also sometimes concerns about, you know, the use of data, personal data uh, that they have to, you know, uh, share with the citizen science uh, uh, project team. And sometimes there's also some bureaucratic you know, uh, actions that have to be taken into account or time constraints. So thus encouraging participation is necessary because of the, you know, normative benefits that participation may lead to in the improvement in citizen science research and innovation. There's a, you know, not necessarily adequate evidence of systematic engagement across citizen science projects. And therefore, we need to truly understand the motives that make people and individuals participate in citizen science and understand based on the nature of their interest in participating, which are the relevant tools and incentives that can be put in place by citizen science teams um, for the purpose of engaging citizens constantly across all phases of the project. Um, what is co-production? Co-production is at the base of collaborating and, and co-creating value in citizen science project because it is the process in which, through which inputs are used to produce a service that are contributed not just by the organization, the team, the university that governs the citizen science research project, but they're contributed also by individuals who are not part of the same organization. Co-production is about the citizens' involvement in service delivery project as uh, could be research. And it's about their contribution, so it's research, contribution through, um, you know, dedicating time to the research, dedicating, you know, their knowledge or expertise and so on and so forth. And there are several determinants of engagement and participation. Uh, the determinants refer to, on one hand, the ability that citizens may have. As I said earlier, they may be providing knowledge and material, and their participation may be about contributing with um, expert related content, or they may just be motivated for different reasons to um, advance science. The reasons may be because they have been into personal situations in which, in which the lack of science or the lack of particular um, you know, a uh, type of services has led them or some members of the families or, you know, people they know to um, um, experiencing um, services or, you know, products or, you know, other situations with not necessarily a creation of value for them. Or it could be motivation that it's intrinsic and related to, you know, personal attitudes, as we said earlier. Now, what we need to understand is based on an ability or motivation element of participation, 
what may stimulate greater engagement because engagement comes at a cost. It's the cost, opportunity cost of dedicating time to a project over to other activities. And it is also uh, a matter of understanding what can, in a sense, elevate these people to constantly and steadily contribute uh, to the project because they may be enthusiastic at an initial phase, but then eventually not continue unless they are kept motivating in the engagement towards the project. And for large projects that have um, challenging tasks to take into account that may also take time to roll out, we need not only to take into consideration incentives for first engagement, but also for steady engagement throughout the project. And there's some tools, some incentive tools that make co-production easier and then facilitate the engager in terms of tools that facilitate the opportunity cost of taking part in meetings or uh, dedicating time and effort to certain research activities and others that elevate the ability that citizens may have in taking part in the project itself. And sometimes they have to be used jointly to both work on the uh, capacity of citizens to participate and also to making it smoother for them to, you know, uh, balance between their private professional life and taking part in citizen science project. This is the first classification of enhancing and motivation uh, in uh, co-production that comes from um, public administration literature and it shows different tools. The tools are, you know, um, of different kind. One is related with sanctions. If you don't do it, then you are going to have a penalty, a fine, a ticket. And of course, this belongs mainly to um, to uh, situations in winter in which there should be a coercive engagement of participants. Um, this is a type of uh, of uh, tool that, of course. Uh, um, wouldn't necessarily be working in the context of volunteering to actively participate in citizen science project. And at some point it may even become counterproductive in stimulative positive behavior because of the context itself. But in general terms, we can talk about um, two main types of rewards that go beyond sanctions, material rewards or intrinsic rewards. Intrinsic rewards are about, you know, the sense of satisfaction that citizens have in taking part in, uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, a, a citizen science project, whereas material rewards are tangible rewards like certificates, like credits for taking part in the project. Um, that can be non-financial or financial, so they can even lead to paying people for uh, participating, like with gift cards or uh, vouchers for certain activities and so on and so forth. Eventually, there are two other types of tools, solidarity incentives, meaning the opportunity of being rewarding by taking part in a community uh, of uh, practice, if you wish, socializing, being part of, uh, of a group of people that may be, you know, representing the community and also, you know, well regarded. And then there's the last type of tool, which is normative appeals, which is about explicit and implicit communication about you know, what is considered to be relevant and valuable in a given community at a given time. Now, there's different type of tools that we can use to stimulate um, you know, ability-related uh, engagement. So if you participate um, in a project and you have to, in a sense, uh, take into account uh, your ability to participate, um, given you know your overall life, you know professional uh, balance. Then it's quite important to invest time 
from the uh, from the citizen science hub perspective in defining you know where to meet how to meet so the mode of incentive and what is adequate to provide participants with to inform them about the project and also making sure that they understand what the project is about and leveraging on the language that's been used as most of the individuals may not necessarily share the jargon that researcher use. And also in certain cases, it's also important to have facilitators to break the ice and carry out ice breaking exercises that you know make everybody feel at ease and able to participate. Now, focusing on the mode of interaction and the use of physical or online tools, so this really depends on the context and it's something that can be also adjusted across the different meetings. Um, you know, depending on the context, the nature of the tasks and what is required to participate. Moving into motivation related tools, there are several of them, but what is very important is to create a trust based relationship between the citizen science team and, you know, people contributing and participating. So, framing the topic, making clear and transparent communication about the scope, the expectations uh, from, you know, uh, citizens. Um, understanding what the key issues are and eventually utilizing incentivation tools like gamification strategies that may work with some particular type of participants, especially the younger ones over persuasion tools that may work with participants who may be uh, older in age or may not necessarily have um, an active and, you know, um, an active and very, you know, enthusiastic uh, interest in participating. And so, you know, that could be also combined with other incentives and the incentives could be at this point um, tangible. So monetary or again, related with certificates, the feels, feeling of recognition and active communication goes in this direction. And a very important point is to make sure that these people eventually uh, get uh, final, you know, feedback, meaning through the dissemination of the results of the project, they can get acknowledged and they can see what their work has led to, how they contributing to making a difference and, you know, being recognized about that. So taking into account that participation, uh, thus it's advocable at all times, it's not necessarily easy to achieve, and that people may be motivated either because of, you know, a personal interest an intrinsic interest an extrinsic interest in showing off that they took part in it or a pro social interest and that they may be contributing with, you know, ability related capacity or just because they're motivated in um, taking part in community effort. What we did with incentive is we have been carrying out an assessment that for the first time asks citizens of four different states across Europe, states that are, you know, so represented uh, by the uh, partners of the incentive project um, and states in which there are citizen science hubs that are that have been established to get a perspective from the general community of, so representative of the general population and not just of people that take part in citizen science hubs, what would make them stimulate their, um, their participation in citizen science initiatives. And the aim of the study has been that of uh, describing how engagement is managed within um, communities and also understand, you know, which in, in engagement tools they would appreciate the most to get an idea of which are the effective methods that may be, you know, farther investigated and rolled out 
to incentivize and engage participants in citizen science hubs. What we did, we selected six tools across the different uh, variety of tools from ability related to motivation related that came, you know, that are quite um, very well established and mature across the literature uh, of citizen science and in general terms of engagement and participation of citizens. And we asked the participants to tell us whether they wanted, you know, they prefer certain modes of involvement over others. Um, they appreciated expert facilitators training to, you know, be elevated to participate in the project. And also, you know, the type of incentive monetary and non-monetary that they had in mind, what their interests would have been if they were to take part in, in this project. And also, you know, would they want it to be with while participating? So we picked the six different tools. And what we did is we interviewed um, a sample representative of the population of uh, four countries. We actually had a lower response rate in one country in particular, the countries being Lithuania, Greece, the Netherlands, and Spain. And we interviewed over a thousand people with a conjoint um, experimental approach aim at presenting two alternative scenarios that would provide different alternatives uh, to each of the six uh, um, tools presented earlier, meaning all six tools were um, showed to all the people that took part in this, in this uh, survey experiment. But what was actually changed in the scenarios that were shown to them was um, the um, operationalization of the variable. For example, modes of participation would have been either in presence or online. And so by looking at this, we identified you know, what matters the most for them. Before I get into the results, I will show you a little bit of the depth of the data about the sample. So we had about uh, 52 percent of female, um, more than 65 percent had uh, more than as less than 40 year, years of age. Um, 93 percent have a high school diploma, 55 have a bachelor degree, and in general terms, 65 percent of them were working, 14 percent students, and 13 percent unemployed. And this is the data that we got. This, this um, data is representative of the population of Greece, the Netherlands, and Spain. It is underrepresenting the population of Lithuania. Um, uh, in general terms, we asked them some basic question, whether they had previous knowledge about citizen science and whether they participated in citizen science project. As you see, in general terms, the awareness is about 50-50. Uh, whereas, you know, participation rates is rather low in all countries, ranging from the Netherlands that has a greater participation rate, close to, you know, um, 20 percent and about 10 percent in the other in the other countries. But um, some of them showed um, some interest in hearing more and potentially, you know, collaborating and taking part in citizen science hubs. And this is the results that we got. So in general terms, this is the result that split by country. Uh, we found that there are some elements that are more relevant than others and that, you know, would be the ones that we would recommend for these countries, but in general terms to take into account. So the mode of incentive online uh, with and some monetary incentives and a mixed group of participating participants in the citizen science initiatives would be the preferred mix of tools for Greece. As you see in Lithuania shows the modes of involvement online and monetary incentives again to be quite relevant for them. And incentives and modes of participation remain relevant, the most relevant tools in Spain 
whereas in the Netherlands, it is more monetary incentives and the dialogue with academic communities. So what we find from this is that overall, there's some consistency uh, relative to some incentives across the different countries. The monetary incentive is something that uh, you know, shows to be significant across all four countries, but be aware that what this survey doesn't tell us is the nature of the monetary incentive. And this would be further, uh, it would have to be further investigated by, you know, uh, exploring well, qualitatively with participants uh, what nature and what, you know, value of this monetary incentive would be appropriate because the literature shows that monetary incentives offer mixed results in terms of participation. In certain cases, it may stimulate further participation. In other, it doesn't prove to be relevant. So it would have to be farther, farther, you know, uh, taken into account. But we also see, for example, the participants um, a question that not everybody, you know, across the different countries, probably because of contextual conditions, feels the same about mixed group. And as you see here from the slide in the Netherlands, academics and the dialogue and the relationship with academics seems to be favored over general mixed participants. So the optimal package that comes out of this of this um, uh, experiment is that uh, mode of involvement online, continuous training in presence and monetary incentives across the four countries appear to be the optimal package that Citizen Science Hub would have to offer to citizens to stimulate their engagement and participation across citizen science projects. And the interesting thing is that when it comes to the expert facilitator, uh, in general terms, it is uh, in person. And when it comes to the participant pools, as you saw, it's mixed for everybody uh, but the Netherlands. And when it comes to the interest, you also see a difference in the interest. There's more a public interest for the well of the well-being of the community over a private interest that is in, in, in one explicit in one country. So this again would lead to further investigate the nature and the values underpinning this interest and leverage communication on these elements in order to stimulate participations. Now, what does this lead us to uh, summarize our activities? Well, it suggests some guidelines to take into account to incentivize and engage quadruple helix stakeholders. Now, here are some elements that we need to take into account. Citizens and other stakeholders may be involved in Citizen Science Hub at different stages. At the co-commissioning stage, that's when you know, there's a strategic identification of the priority of the hub, the needs that it would serve, and, you know, the framing of its positioning. The co-design is about the planning, the creation of arrangements, and the perspective of the citizen science hub. The delivery is about the research activities themselves. It's about blurring the line between the design and the implementation where you can really get an understanding of what works and what doesn't and framing problems and finding solution all at once. Then eventually the assessment, which is understanding what works and what doesn't. And this is very important to have to keep into account and to, you know, have mixed participants because um, the risk of having only citizens, only users, only academics would be that of taking one side or the other, for example, with the risk of missing the opportunity of checking for and controlling for organizational feasibility. So I would also suggest to utilize organizational impact analysis once you identify solutions that mainly come from the ideas and the support of um, external stakeholders, because it could be that they are not feasible from the perspective of the organizations that eventually would have to roll them out. Um, 
what is important to understand, as I said already, is that uh, citizen science um, and citizen participation in citizen science uh, has to be carefully planned and governed. And it's quite interesting that among the optimal package to, to offer uh, incentives to citizens, there's also training because uh, making sure that everybody has the right ability to participate is quite important. And also another key element is to make sure that you don't just onboard citizens that would represent um, some communities or some part of the communities over others. The risk is always to um, create uh, um, inequalities. And in fact, the risk is to uh, forget about vulnerable stakeholders, which should also be represented across all the activities. And um, what the final part of this presentation is about is a set of guides about tools to use, when to use them, how to use them and strengths and weaknesses. So most of involvement, thus we said that from the uh, empirical analysis, it shows that the preferred modes of involvement is online. This can be mainly done for commissioning design and assessment, whereas the co-production would probably require them to be all, you know, at the labs and take part, uh, you know, actively with the activities. The strengths of using mo online modes of interaction is that you can get greater participation, but also people may not have the right digital culture, or there could be physical barriers to participate, or, you know, um, online workshop work, but also you need to keep people still engaged because especially if they're long, they may eventually lose their, you know, attention. And so using gamification strategies, attention checks may help into keeping them, um, you know, uh, attract to the workshops um, across the whole time. Expert facilitation. Well, this is very important. Expert facilitation can, has to be used across all phases because it is the way in which you can create trust and at the same time onboard uh, people making sure that they feel at ease. What's relevant is to set up a proper governance and also allocate resources for this because it comes at a cost. And again, you need to take it into account. And when it comes to continuous training, well, this is about making sure that people stay engaged. And it's also one incentive. If you invest in training for your citizens to participate in Citizen Science Hub, that means that you are willing you know, to share knowledge with them, but it also, it has to be planned within the project because you have to consider who does that, whether they have to be paid, allocating budget to that, and also making sure that you recognize that there's two types of, um, of training that has to be taken into account. Technical training for ability purposes, but also more coaching and mindfulness training for motivational purposes. Overall, these incentives can be used across all the phases, and I would regularly suggest that you, uh, that you go in this direction and that you also consider the monetary and non-monetary incentives. Monetary incentives require you to plan ahead, and they require you to have in mind what that means, what is allowed according to regulation, what is proper, and also investigate further whether it will work in your specific environment. And uh, how to take into account the mixed groups of stakeholders? Well, I mean, uh, diversity is a value, but it needs to be governed, and therefore orchestration is required. And this is, again, something to take into account. And again, different values underpinning the um, the um, um, motivation of citizens to participate have to be balanced. You need to find ways in which you identify specific elements or specific principles around which you can create a group. Diversity is important, but it can also lead to dangerous collisions. And as such, you really need to orchestrate uh, communication initiatives to make sure that everybody feels on board and they feel that their interests are being safeguarded. 
So this is a drill down of what can be done in terms of moving into the opportunities of developing a plan for stakeholder engagement. You need to allocate role and responsibilities, plan it over time, um, use different tools across the different phases, make sure you understand which incentive works to support the scope of each phase of the project, recruit them in a way that it stays inclusive and provide them with material. As I said, this is something that is, you know, requires careful planning and careful allocation of budget, and it can really lead to some quite remarkable, um, you know, outcomes. So again, involvement mode, I would suggest a mixed approach to be identified based on your, on your specific project expert facilitator and continuous training. Thus, this may become really burdening and it can also be, you know, quite, uh, quite expensive. Monetary incentives. I mean, it should be a recognition of their work. It could be by performance if you have um, participants that are motivated by extrinsic motivation that would stimulate to even do better. But at the same time, you realize that it's not the only incentive to put it in place. And pools of stakeholders can be mixed. And it can also be, I would suggest it to be have it mixed to avoid the risk of having one voice prevail over another. So having said this, I really want to thank you and I hope you enjoyed this. And I look forward to hearing your experiencing about using some of these incentive tools in your own practices. Thank you and have a good day.